Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this special Slimers webinar on beetle monitoring. Uh, my name's Tom Allen Stevens. I lead the British On Farm Innovation Network, and we also lead on this project. And we're delighted to be working with UK Agritech Centre Crop Health and Protection, or CHAP, uh, with the small robot company, uh, with Harper Adams University, Aggravation, and with the John Innes Centre. Uh, now, I'm just going to share my screen again. Now, in a moment, I'll be handing over to Kelly Jowett, who I hope uh, will be joining us. And as many of you know, leads a research in beetle monitoring at Rothamsted. Uh, but before I do, I just want to give you an update on Slimers and some of the other activity um, uh, and projects that Boffin has been engaged on on your behalf. So uh, firstly, the NCS project, um, uh, looking to grow more pulses and replace soya in livestock diets with homegrown pulses. Uh, we're on the lookout for Pulse Pioneers, following the Pulses of Brilliance workshop that we held last month. And so do look out for how to be involved uh, in that one. Uh, now, as far as slug, slug resistant wheat is underway for the second year, some of you may have been following uh, this, this project. Um, now, we have got an update on our YouTube channel uh, on, on this and the, the results of the feeding trials last year. The really interesting thing here, by the way, uh, is that um, so we've confirmed that Watkins 788, this land race variety, um, uh, is consistently spurned by slugs. What's more, we also tested a lot of um, a, a, a selection of wheats that our slug students will actually be growing, the, the farm standard wheats. Um, and we found that there is actually quite a wide variety in, in how palatable these modern wheats are to slugs. Not quite as unpalatable as Watkins 788, but there is a range, which was quite interesting. And we'll see how that then confers in the field. We are on the lookout. We're doing some more testing, um, uh, feeding trials in the lab. Thank you so much to all of you who have sent in slugs. Uh, we are on the lookout for more slugs. There's information on how to get hold of it or do just get in touch and we can send you out a slug scouting pack. Uh, we need another thousand slugs to test the Watkins rules. So these are crosses of Watkins with um, uh, uh, with modern wheat, uh, Paragon. Uh, and, uh, and you can see them there in the photo. I went to visit them up in Norwich. Um, uh, we've got a few of them that we've multiplied up already, ready for trials that will be going into the ground next autumn. So very exciting uh, progress on that particular project. Um, uh, also, um, I, I hope uh, some of you have had a chance to catch up with the Boffin Buzz, which is our new podcast. Um, and uh, we've got three episodes now that we have uh, we have done. Um, really uh, interesting conversations um, with, um, uh, first of all, Tom Thurkins, uh, Thurkel, sorry, from the Crop Science Centre. We've also had a conversation about harvest weed seed control uh, with Will Smith and John Cousins. Uh, really uh, useful insight into weed control there. And uh, most recently, Clive Blacker, who'll be joining us in a minute. Uh, so um, uh, uh, now, um, uh, also look out for CropTech. I hope you can join us at CropTech, uh, which is coming up on the 28th and 29th of November. Now, just a note, by the way, that um, uh, those of you who are slug sleuths, there will be points available for those uh, attending uh, CropTech. Um, there's more details in your in your pack on that, or we can give you more details. Uh, but um, uh, we really, really want as many of our members, and especially the slug sleuths, uh, to turn up um, uh, to crop tech. We've got some really exciting announcements that we're going to be making there. Um, and uh, as far as the slug slew, the the slimers campaign itself is is uh, concerned. We now have 29 slug sleuths. So thank you very much uh, to all of you who have signed up. These are the slug sleuths who will be paid uh, to do our, our slug monitoring. Um, I'm not going to dwell too much on that, just to say that um, Clive Blacker has been racing around the country, scanning fields. Uh, we've also got quite a few of them being terror mapped by Hutchinson's. And uh, great to have the involvement of uh, no fewer than nine Hutchinson's agronomists. So thank you very much uh, to, to you for taking part. You're a really valuable part of this hugely important project. Uh, it really is 
uh, one of the biggest, I, I would suspect, uh, Keith will probably pull me up on this one, but uh, I suspect this is a, about the biggest project uh, that there has ever been um, uh, looking at slugs in terms of the spread of sites, in terms of the number of people involved um, uh, and so on. It really is. It's, it's a very exciting and groundbreaking project, this one. Uh, and uh, so thank you very much for all involved. Do follow it on the slug circle. And I'll tell you a bit more about that in a moment. Uh, we're going to be deploying almost 3,000 slug traps uh, around the country and we're expecting uh, over 15,000 data points and 3,000 photos. There's going to be so much data coming from this project. It's going to be very exciting. Uh, and as I say, we have now launched the Slug Circle on the Farming Forum. Um, those of you who have joined the Slug Circle, you should have received joining instructions on how to contribute to it. We do want your contributions. It's so important um, that we get the discussion going on slugs because knowledge has value and farmer knowledge has more value than most knowledge uh, that's out there to uh, available to us. Uh, and so, but that knowledge will only get out there if we have the means to do it. So please get on there and get the discussion going and ask questions as well. Um, so, but the, the, the point of today is to look at beetle monitoring. Uh, so uh, hopefully, uh, so here we are, this is what we're after. We're after these That's what we really want to do. Um, and I'm delighted, uh, sorry, the, just to go briefly through the agenda, um, uh, uh, we're going to be joined in a minute by, by Kelly, as I say, I'm delighted she has now joined us. Um, uh, so we're then going to, I'm then going to explain a little bit uh, about how to be involved uh, in this exciting um, uh, element of the project. Um, and we're then going to be joined by um, uh, Professor Keith Walters uh, from Harper Adams University and Clive Blacker um, uh, as well. And also, um, and Becky Berry, um, I do apologise, Becky, I've left you off the list there. But Becky Berry, who's a local farmer, very local to me actually as well, um, who's going to be joining us. Um, and we're going to be in, uh, uh, discussing some of the, uh, the issues around, uh, around uh, beetle monitoring. So without further ado... Uh, let me introduce uh, Kelly Jowett. Uh, uh, Kelly, uh, 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 thank you very much uh, for joining us. Um, hang on a second, let me stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, Kelly. Um, uh, and, and, and many of you know, Kelly is a leading light in beetle, in looking at uh, beetle research at Rothamsted uh, Research. Uh, so uh, I, I won't dwell any more on that, Kelly. I'll let you introduce yourself and uh, give your presentation. So I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Okay, um, let me figure out how to share screen on, on Zoom. I'm more used to, ah, share screen. There we go. Well, I'm delighted to be here and to be a part of such a, a well-designed project, and we're going to get some fantastic data out of this, so I'm really excited about it. Um, so thank you for inviting me. Um, their screen. Can everyone see see my lovely beetles? Okay, so um, just to go over kind of a background about carabid beetles, how and why we monitor them. Oh, I'm on slide two. So caribbean beetles are all around the world in all kinds of environments, so we know a lot about them. Um, but particularly in agricultural settings, they're kind of predators of a range of, of crop pests. And some people don't realise that they also eat weed seeds, so up to 4,000 weed seeds per metre squared per day, which is a really lovely statistic about weed seeds being removed as competition from the crop. Um, we've got some good statistics around this, but um, you'll notice in my kind of statistics there that it doesn't mention slugs, so it'd be really nice to get some protection figures around that and about the dynamics of that. But I kind of think of them as the hyenas of the beetle world. They will eat pretty much anything they come across, but uh, it's not just the adult slugs like we saw in that lovely video a minute ago. We're also thinking about their activity in the soil, looking at the, um, the small eggs and the uh, smaller like baby slugs as well. So that's quite important to consider in terms of 
suppressing populations like so we don't see it when they come to an adult but if you've got a good beetle population you won't notice that they're doing the work before they kind of do so figuring out where they occur in the field um kind of correlated with the slug abundance will be really useful in figuring that out particularly um seeing as in the life cycle we have eggs then larva then pupa then adults the larva are the key life stage and may be quite instrumental in controlling slugs in that they actually live in the soil for most of the year and they're active in the winter time and such when the adults aren't particularly active so, and they are also more predatory than the adults because they need the protein for growth so they might be quite key to look for. So that's that's why I'm showing you a picture of the larva particularly. But just as a kind of ecological background here, carabids need um, farm resources and thinking about it in the invertebrates, not like us, they kind of go through different life stages where they need different things. So they need different areas to feed, breed and shelter. So the larva need kind of environments in the field whereby they breed in the soil of the field and that kind of environment. So things such as low tillage are particularly important for supporting carabid beetles or tillage at certain times. And the way that carabid beetles use the farm landscape is that they need areas to rest and kind of where there's not much disturbance such as there is in the crop, but they move into the crop for foraging and breeding. <laughs> Lovely animation there. Um, and an important aspect that I don't think I'll have to go too much into with this crowd is that they need refuge from pesticides. So every time that you spray, you are essentially taking out a whole population. Caribbean beetles are said to be quite robust to pesticides, but I will say that when I've looked into this in, in the kind of studies, yeah, they're, they're funded by chemical companies and they're only looking at direct mortality. And if you think about the, the action method of a lot of pesticides, it's to suppress the ability of insects to feed on crops and also to breed. So this suppresses the populations of um, beneficial insects um, just as much as it has action on the pests. And if you think about beneficial insects, they have these kind of populations that are more resident in areas. So they take longer to recover than the pests, which can reproduce exponentially. So the impacts of pesticides are more kind of baseline than, than the pests. There's a better word for that that I can't think of right now. Um, so when we're thinking about service efficiency of carabid beetles, what I didn't mention is there is about 350 species in the UK, 30 of which are common in farmland, and they all have slightly different attributes. So we have run in from about three centimetres in size down to about four millimetres in size. Some of them can fly. Some of them have lost the ability to fly because they are mostly kind of running on the ground. Um, some of them will crawl just along the ground. Some of them will climb up into kind of crops and, and hunt for aphids. And some of them are more soil active, like the Trechus quadristriatus on the end, which we may we think is particularly value in the control of um, cabbage stem flea beetle. Some of them are specialists in weed seeds. So they will just eat weed seeds, like the Harpalus rufipes in the middle there. But we're particularly interested in the slug predators at the end, which is the uh, carabus species and the Trostica species. So the violet ground beetle and the black clock species. So I'll, I'll mention a bit more of those as we go. So when I started my PhD six long years ago, um, I read in the literature that we've, we're thinking about carabids in farm landscapes in the terms of semi-natural areas such as hedgerows and field margins. And they mostly, uh, they're said to mostly inhabit these areas and spill over into crop areas. So you will see this decline in abundance as you get towards the crop centre. Now that has been seen in some studies, but the the first big piece of research I did showed the exact opposite, that there was actually, if you look at this is the abundance um, going upwards and then acrosswards is the abundance, the distance from the field edge. So the field centre is at that 30 metre mark there. 
in terms of this study, um, I actually saw the most abundance in field centres. And this was a huge study across the whole of the UK over multiple years. But when we broke this down, and this is the problem with a lot of research, they look at carabid beetles as a whole, so a pooled abundance of all the carabid beetles. When I broke this down at, by species and looked at it in, in the different colours that you can see there, corresponding to the species at the side, this was actually mostly on the Terosticus melanaris, which is the black clock, which is actually a key predator of slugs. So that's happy news that it's in the crop centres where, where we would like it to be. But this does vary. They do have a particular preference in this study for sugar beet. So that may be due to the, the resources in the crop centre. So I was looking more into this. And I wanted to also find out about the larva. So um, pitfall trapping works on the basic premise. We're going to take you through this in more detail later, but you basically bury a cup in the ground. The beetles fall into the cup and die. And unfortunately, you do need to kill them because they will eat each other. Like I say, hyenas of the beetle world, they'll eat anything they come across. And if they're in a cup for a number of days just with the friends, they'll eat the friends. Um, but I wanted to find out about the larva, and because the soil active, I uh, picked up on this design that they use in ant studies of subterranean trapping. So it's like a wire mesh, and the, the larva come through the soil, any other soil invertebrates do too, so it's quite interesting for other soil inverts. And they fall into the pitfall trap that's set down, and you have to hook a duck it out. Um, so I looked at that across a rotation experiment that we've got, which allows us to do a lot of repetitions. And what you can see here is the X's um, kind of indicate abundance on the same kind of upward scale. And then we've got different treatments. Um, so what I found was if we just use standard pitfall traps, you may think that there's not very many carabid larva in barley under sown with grass. But in fact, the underground activity was much more in that treatment. So there was more subterranean activity of lava in that. And I won't take you through every little panel on here, but just to say that the effects of tillage in this experiment actually weren't universal by species. Some of them were more impacted by tillage. So you can see the big Carabus violaceus down on the right hand corner there. That was actually more impacted and in a zero till system, there was more of those large beetles, which are slug predators. So that's quite interesting. Um, my last large experiment that I did for my PhD was across the farm here at Rothamsted, where I had both types of traps alongside experimental margins, because I wanted to find out more about that spillover effect from semi-natural habitats. So this was along a, a number of crops, a number of kind of different types of margins. And what we had was um, pitfall traps in the margin area, in a kind of spillover zone, and then in the field centre, as far as I could get to it, that was standardised. So these were kind of one way and two way transects, just for kind of reference when I show you this. So those little different symbols are likewise abundances across different panels of the graphs of treatments. And the crops are along the bottom. So we've got spring barley, oats, spring oilseed rape, winter barley, winter oilseed rape, and wheat. And you can see that the, the abundances of the beetles vary by margin, uh, by kind of crop all the time. But universally, where you have a grass margin, in the spillover zone of crop edge, there were less beetles, indicating that that margin may act as a little bit of a barrier to them getting into the crop. The crop centre kind of X's, the red X's, they were kind of the same in all of the kind of charts. It's, it's the other ones that move around. And what you see as well is that where there's a wildflower margin, the beetle abundances were actually less in that margin. So they weren't persisting in that kind of margin area, which was interesting. So the margins were actually, in some cases, maybe acting as a barrier and not supporting the beetles in the actual margin, which is quite interesting because it's one of the things that farmers like to do most for the beetles. Now, I just want to take you through these graphs. You're going to have to take my word for it on a quick explanation, but this is an ordination plot. So where the beetles sit in relation to those kind of crop pictures is how associated they are with those particular crops. 
And the percent of variance explained by these models is we want to see a higher number because that explains more about what beetles are where. So there's a relatively high percentage of uh, the variation explained in this by crop alone. So what is in the field influences what beetles are in the field makes sense. Um, what is adjacent to the field explains slightly less abundance, but it's still important in what beetles are where. But the margin type actually explains quite a low amount of the variance. So it's not as important as the landscape in determining what beetles are where in crops. So that's quite interesting. So to kind of sum up my whole research thing, so which species we have is important. So that's both in terms of tolerances. So they tolerate different conditions and they um, kind of, so some beetles will particularly thrive in wet areas, some beetles dry soils, um, and they provide different predation. The field margins may not be as important for carabids. Now I stress this, they are important for other invertebrates. I'm not saying take out your field margins, please don't. Um, but for carabid beetles, we may want to think about the placement of them a bit more. So not between two fields where you want the beetles to move between, maybe more as a buffer to um, roads, kind of areas like urban areas or things that might have disturbance impacts. So maybe looking at where you put field margins more. Farm habitat landscape, its context is important. So we, we want to find out more about that. And the infield habitats may be the most important. So in my research, I would really like to find out more about the practice of under sowing, but also kind of tillage effects and what happens to the beetles in, in different kinds of things, because I don't have a lot of data to do with this. And a lot, a lot of people have looked at what happens really in the field centers. So this study that we're, we're talking about with the Bofin Slimers project will be particularly valuable for that. So at Rothamsted, when we're thinking about our experiments, when we look at our ones, um, we can only sample comprehensively a few kind of fields. When we work with other farmers, we can sample a little bit, but we've got, when we look at it and we try to get data from a lot of different farmers, I can get more data about the beetles so I can it's less sampling effort for me and I can get a lot more data to work with and really pick apart what's happening in those kind of areas and what interventions might be the best. So um, I did a survey also as part of my PhD and a lot of farmers told me that uh, they would be willing to try to monitor beetles if they had advice. So I was like okay um, so the, the barriers to them carrying out monitoring was particularly a lack of training and a lack of time. So I thought, what's the best way to uh, kind of get around these? So I produced the Farmland Carabids ID guide, which I will take you over the kind of premise of that in a little while. But also a kind of protocol where you can just do three traps as a minimum and still get some data to kind of feed into your own management, but also into the larger scale data collection, which I will then analyze and be able to advise you more on your management. So you get the, you get the benefit two ways in that way, but we're going to adapt that protocol for the Slimers project, but also for the uh, farming forum project you will be kind of running this this standard protocol so you can run that protocol just in one set of three pitfall traps or you can ramp up the effort by doing it in multiple fields or running them back to back over time so it's that kind of baseline unit and um, my pilot farmers found it really easy to do they didn't, didn't think there was any faults with the protocol at all so I was really happy about that uh, some people got got the family involved and, and everyone had a kind of fun time doing it. So I was really encouraged by that. And farmers were able to get some useful information. And you can see here that just from my pilot study, I'm seeing the same kind of pattern that I'd seen in my work, which kind of still goes against the literature, that there's less beetles in the margins and more beetles in the field centre which is interesting. So if we can get down to the kind of specifics of how this works, that would be really nice. Um, and farmers were able to identify themselves to species. I will say there's probably a little bit of error in this, but once you get your eye in, 
it is quite easy to um, identify beetles. So let me show you a little example. So these are the key slug predators that I have been mentioning. So it's a, a kind of, well, I won't tell you the names yet, but these are the key ones. So they all kind of, to the untrained eye, look very similar. So the way the guide works is not like the dichotomous keys that I have to use as an entomologist. It, we go through first a flow chart. So if we look at beetles by size, can we get a bit more kind of definition between the ones there? Yes, so they're different sizes. So we can pick them apart by that kind of identification feature. Next thing that we look at would be color. And although they're, they're all kind of black, the violet ground beetle here um, does shine up violet. It's just that particular picture. And sometimes in pitfall traps, I will say, especially if you're using ethanol or substances like that, that can kind of degrade the structure of the beetle's um, outer kind of shell and it makes them less shiny, which is sad because they are very beautiful when they're fresh. Um, but you may still see that kind of violet color. So I've included that one as both colors on the key. So, and the red legged one on the end there, um, that has a black legged form, which is a little bit confusing. So we'll, we'll ignore that and just kind of treat them all as black at the moment. So is there anything else we can tell them apart by? Well, the general shape, it's a bit of a stretch of the imagination on the first large one there. It's, it's less an hourglass and more like a big figure eight. But you can see that it's got a bit of a pinch at the waist there and a big bum. Whereas the other ones are more kind of rectangular generally, if you squint your eyes a bit. So they're all kind of rectangular. So in the flow chart, we would then go to the pages to pick out the key kind of differences. So the kind of middle section, which is kind of like the waistcoat of the beetle, um, that has a very different kind of form. Once you get to look at them, you can see it quite obviously. And if you use a 10 times hand lens, it can be quite obvious. To me, I can pick them apart really easily. So it just takes getting your eye in to tell these apart. And then you can look for the other identification features if you like. For the purposes of the Slimers project, even just getting to the level of identifying um, the violet ground beetle from the black clock species, that would be fantastic data because no one's got that kind of data yet. So even getting to that level would be fantastic. And just to say that farmers had also, after the pilot study, asked me um, for what could be improved it. So they asked for a phone app, that would be good. Um, so with CEH, we developed a phone app that currently we're trialing. Eventually, hopefully, we'll build an automatic identifier, but we need a lot more photos in order to train, train that software. And also training events have been quite good. So if, if you guys requested it, I could come out and do a training event. So somewhere down the line, that might be something we could do. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Uh, any questions? No, well, thank you very much for that, uh, that Kelly. That, that that was that was brilliant. Um, uh, I, I was just going to um, uh, quickly run through um, uh, what the the support that we're going to be giving to slug sleuths and also those people who would like to to join um, uh, and do some beetle monitoring, even if you're not a slug sleuth. Um, uh, but before I do, just wanted to point out that if you did want to put in some questions, if you have a look at the bottom of your screen, there is the Q and A uh, and the chat box there. So please do um, put questions uh, for, for Kelly in there which we'll come to in just a moment um, and we've also got as I say we've got um, uh, Keith Walters uh, uh, who's who's joined us as well and Clive Blacker and also uh, Becky Berry um, who's one of our slug sleuths uh, who's joined uh, so do please put questions uh, into the into the Q&A there um, and also get the chat going uh, as well let me just quickly share my screen uh, have I no I've done the wrong well, that's right, so excuse me. Um, try that one again. Uh, it's that one. There we go. Um, 
Fantastic. So the um, the support that we're going we're offering to slug sleuths. So those slug sleuths who would like to, we, we've got a limited number um, who can be involved. Um, uh, but um, uh, for those who would like to do some beetle monitoring within their slug um, uh, area, um, uh, here is the grid uh, that you'll be following. It's a hundred traps um, of um, uh, uh, looking at the at the slug populations, um, uh, and then within that. Um, we um, what we'll be doing is putting twenty uh, traps uh, to monitor beetles uh, and the and the and the pitbull traps that Kelly was talking about. The idea of this is to see how beetle populations um, uh, are related to slug populations, uh, and we'll get some idea of of the dynamics uh, that are going on there. I hope uh, and hopefully get a bit of a picture of just how much of a contribution carabid beetles make to uh, slug control. Um, so, uh, as you can see, the grid there is is uh, labelled from A to T, twenty traps, um, and we'll supply the uh, the traps themselves. You can see the pictures on the right hand side. Um, there's a I've got the the bits here. So this is what we send out. Um, the liner that Kelly was referring to is a as, as a plastic pint tumbler, uh, and then this is the cup that goes in that, that where the um, uh, the beetles will actually fall into. And what you'd need to do is um, put uh, a, a little bit of water in the bottom here um, and, and a, just a, a drop of washing up liquid. The idea of the washing up liquid is that it um, uh, stops the beetle floating on the top um, so that they do drown. Uh, sorry about that, beetles. Um, and, um, uh, and then you can monitor them. Over the top, you have the hat to um, make sure that, um, that it doesn't get full up with uh, rainwater. And we also supply a couple of little spikes uh, to hold it up out of the ground, as you can see in the picture there. Um, uh, so now, um, as Clive comes round, I'm talking specifically to the slug sleuths here, as Clive comes round um, uh, laying out your traps, um, if you wanted to take part in the beetle monitoring, he will also lay out your beetle monitoring traps uh, as well. Um, what you will also receive uh, is um, uh, a little sieve so here, so that you can um, pour out your trap um, and sieve off the water. Uh, and then pop it onto a little tray, uh, these trays, um, uh, and then take a photograph. Um, now, uh, and we've got a special bit on the um, the husk app so that you can send your photographs in. I hope that what we can do, and as you can see from the photograph here, I hope what we can do um, from the photographs is help with the ID. But at the same time, if you can do some ID in the field, that would be brilliant. Um, the main thing that we're looking for is the main is, is the number of, of beetles. But if you can try to identify the carabid beetles and specifically um, the violet ones that Kelly was talking about, and also the black lock uh, species, um, uh, that would be really useful. Uh, but if you can photograph them, uh, then at least we've got them captured, and maybe we'll be able to identify them, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 by some other means. So. Um, that's the support. So those people who, uh, who take part will also get a, a guide like this. Um, uh, and, and it's got full details on, on, on what to do uh, in this guide. Um, uh, but for those people who aren't um, uh, slugs lose and who want to take part in this, we are also offering a limited number of traps. So um, uh, if, uh, Kelly was talking about the three traps um, that you can lay out as a minimum. Um, and we will supply you with the three traps uh, and the hats and everything uh, to help you get going on that. Um, as I say, we have a limited number of those traps that we can we can hand out. Um, and so it will be subject to availability. Um, uh, but the, the what we ask is that you come onto the farming forum uh, and let us know what you know, uh, what you uh, give us some track counts, give us some feedback, also ask questions. And Kelly has very kindly uh, agreed to help uh, on the farming forum to uh, answer any queries and questions uh, that people have, provide some advice. Um, uh, perhaps even do some identification. I don't know. It depends on how much time uh, you've got, Kelly. I guess. Um, uh, so, um, uh, we, but we also uh, um, do encourage you to uh, get onto the app uh, as well, the um, uh, which helps with the identification of beetles. Um, uh, but the main thing is that we want that information um, brought onto the farming forum. So, if you do take part in this, please come onto the farming forum. Um, uh, the slug circle in the farming forum uh, and give us uh, some feedback, give us some, um, uh, you know, ask for advice and so on. Let's get the discussion going. As I say, knowledge has value. So, um, well, uh, 
that's um uh let me just stop sharing my screen now i as i say i'm delighted that we're joined by professor keith walters uh clive blacker from aggravation uh and becky berry who's uh, one of our slugs so would you like to turn on your videos uh guys and um uh, join us. Thank you very much uh, for, for, for coming along this morning. Um, uh, so I just wanted to um, uh, find out, first of all, um, the uh, so this relationship between, uh, I mean, we know that, that carabid beetles eat slugs, uh, they predate on slugs. Do we know much about the, the relationship between slugs and carabid beetles? Uh, Keith, I was, I was going to ask you, you've done an, an awful lot of work into slug behaviour, how much do we know, um, if anything, about the, the sort of dynamics, if you like, between slugs and beetles? Uh, I think, as Kelly summarised it, relatively little. There are some tantalising glimpses. Uh, the hard data isn't there. This uh, experiment would give a little bit of a start on it, but it would be only a start in order to, to get that in. Interestingly, I was listening to Kelly's, Kelly's talk and it reminded me, and I just picked off the shelf a book we published a bit in, in that I actually did look at uh, carabids against um, other pests, yeah. uh, aphids in, the, in that uh, case, in the 1990s, 1992, 93 and 93, 94 season. Um, didn't look at the slugs, but I can back up something Kelly was saying is that the uh, hedgerows do act as a reservoir in the event of treatment of, of pesticides. In that experiment, we had a mini uh, uh, grid trapping, such as the one we're looking here, but on a smaller scale. And we treated some, grid, some grids, we didn't treat others. They all had a common uh, boundary, which was a hedge, but no uh, predator headlands in there, critical. Um, what we found there that things like uh, Melanarius, Drosticus Melanarius, were bashed heavily in the field with, by pesticides. They were less good pesticides than we have these days, all those times ago. But critically, in all the fields we looked at, between six and 12 weeks, they just flooded back out of the, um, out of the edges. So they are a good, I think, uh, suppression mechanism, just as Kelly as was saying, to reduce the slug, uh, the, potentially reduce the slug populations, mm -hmm. but um, probably not to actually control them reliably in every year. But the more you reduce the population, no matter how much it is, the less frequent, frequently thresholds for the application of pesticides are going to be applied and they're uh, going to apply and therefore the less pesticides you need to put on. Right. Good for the economics, uh, good for the environment. Great. No, thank you very much for that. Well, the, uh, by the way, I have to say um, one thing to point out here is that the reason we're doing this beetle monitoring, it wasn't actually part of the um, original plan for Slimers. Um, although SLIMERS stands for strategies uh, leading to improved management and enhanced resilience against slugs, uh, and this is a potential strategy. The reason we're doing it is because of you. Um, you asked for it. This was feedback from yourselves um, uh, that you wanted to know more about what beetles were doing in terms of, of slug control. And one of the farmers who'd been most vocal on that is Becky. Um, uh, and uh, you took part in some um, monitoring we were doing last year, uh, Becky. So tell me a little bit um, about that and you know why you're interested in beetles. Well, it was really a, um, an unintended consequence of doing the research last year when we did the slug resistant wheat trial. Um, last year, as everyone will remember, it was a particularly dry autumn, unlike this year and this season. Um, and so the, the, there were less slugs about. Now, the other thing we noticed every time I went to the trap, there were beetles there um, and these big black beetles that I didn't know what they were. Um, and then we were sort of learning that maybe um, because of the warmer weather and the drier weather, the higher um, population of beetles might have been suppressing the slugs we don't know and the fact that nobody knew that was sort of why I was like well why don't we know that um and so that's why I'm keen to monitor and the other thing listening to Kelly's talk it's fascinating looking at the research that um she's done for her PhD 
Um, but there's lots of questions that I have on uh, mixed farming approaches. You know, with the beetle population, I see Andrew's asking the questions, do all pesticides affect the beetles or just insecticides? And is that a built up um, thing year on year? And sometimes by having cattle or sheep in the rotation with pasture, does that help the population in subsequent years? Um, and therefore, by looking at changing our rotation so it's not continually arable for those of us that have the opportunity to do that, does that help our beetle population? So I'm hoping that some of these studies and, and conversations that we have will, will add to um, data. Um, and again, from Kelly's talk, you know, I've got beetle banks around the place. I've no, I've never monitored the beetles in there. I've no idea they've been in for almost 20 years now. Um, so just being able to monitor them ourselves rather than relying on, you know, an agronomist or somebody to come and have a look for me is, is mm. brilliant. Well, let's see what we what we can what we can do in, in this within this project. But uh, Clive, you've been you're as I say, you're racing around the country. I think you're up in Kelso at the moment, actually, just about to visit um, just down the road from uh, David, who is, uh, I believe, David Fuller Shapcott, who has also uh, joined the webinar today. Um, uh, and um, uh, no, so tell me, uh, Clive, can you uh, g give us a little bit of a description of, of what you're what you're doing and, and also um, the uh, the laying out of the traps? I mean, gosh, it's going to be it's going to be quite a you've got a lot of traps uh, to lay out, I think. Um, uh, and if you could just sort of tell us a little bit about um, laying out the, the beetle traps as well, that'd be useful. Yeah, so the, what we've been doing is uh, doing an electrical conductivity scan of the soils on, across the fields um, as we've been going round. So the idea of that is we understand uh, the variance in our soil textures. Um, we're using that information combined with the data that farmers are giving us about where they think the slug patches are in fields and then trying to put the, uh, I'm putting the traps out in an area that I know infringes on where the slugs are active, but equally where the potentially the soil types will change as well and where potentially there won't be any slug activity. So we've got within a hectare square, 100 points. Uh, we're taking 100 soil samples from, from these, but th that's got a bit of soil texture variation and a bit of slug, a slug variation in terms of population density. Um, then within there, we're sticking in uh, on the sites that those that are wanting to do it, beetle traps as well. And, and um, I'm only just getting started, but I'm, I'm horrified at how quickly everybody's drilling at the minute and worried I'm not going to get around everything at the moment. Um, uh, I hadn't appreciated when we set the trials up that you would find people in Scotland Kent and Devon um, yes. to try and get around. <laughs> well, we have got a really good spread of sites. That's one of the great strengths uh, Absolutely. Of, of, of this um, of this thing. And, and just for those people who, who aren't aware of, of um, why we're doing this work, uh, it's mainly to uh, look at patch location uh, and trying to, um, to uh, tell from the soil factors, um, uh, predict where the, where the slugs will gather in patches. Uh, we know there's very, very strong evidence um uh that uh that slugs do gather in patches thanks uh largely to the, a lot of the work that keith walters has been doing um and that's the main uh thing that we're looking to find within this study uh so uh, uh um keith you, you wanted to raise something there yes uh it's a good uh, point to come to this uh one of the things i would uh very much beg not ask but beg people to do if they're going to run the carabin trial is to be very, very careful how it's done. As you were saying, our techniques uh, are a development of what we have used before to find where those patches are. Um, I was saying to you just before uh, this webinar started that I've been talking to colleagues over in the States about what are their experiments, a very different thing. And one of the issues we came up with was that changes in parts of a field to soil structure, uh, uh, not soil structure, so but the compaction of soil, even through trampling, may affect the slug catches in nearby traps. So please, please, please follow protocol. Don't put the pitfall traps right next to the slug traps. And please do not uh, uh, trample too much through the crop when you're emptying them. Secondly, I noticed in the picture to illustrate the, the, the pitfall trap, uh, Kelly had, uh, had cleared some of the vegetation, the, the crop around the trap. Please don't do that 
near to a slug trap that can all affect slug distributions. Um, yeah. Get the slug assessments affected, then not only is that going to really jeopardize the main function of this, which is the location of slug patches, which is a very detailed statistical analysis done to do that, but also it's going to affect the relationship between the caribou catches and sl uh, slug catches with slug catches we wrong. So this really is important. Please follow both pro protocols to the letter, absolutely to the letter. So otherwise uh, we, we will weaken the whole experiment. No, that's a very good point, Keith, and thank you very much for bringing that up. We, the, the, the design of the, of the grid is um, that the, the beetles are the beetle traps are at least five meters away from the, from the slug traps. Um, and it's a it's a good point worth worth pointing out that um, uh, yes, obviously we're asking you to monitor the traps once a week for five weeks. Um, uh, but um, if uh, otherwise, you can limit uh, the amount of movement through the the field. Otherwise, just treat the field uh, or the hectare block um, in exactly the same way as the rest of the field. If you apply slug pellets on the rest of the field, apply it over the uh, the area. If you apply pesticides on the rest of the field, apply it over the, the same area. And, and I just want to bring up, um, so uh, Kelly, you've, I think you've already answered the question that um, uh, Andrew Barr, thank you very much, Andrew, for your for your questions that you've, you've put into the Q&A uh, on pesticides, the effect of pesticides. And we did talk about this. Uh, you, you talked about it um, uh, as well. But I, I just want to come back to this. I mean, one of the things that I think would be very interesting um, uh, as part of the study, perhaps, is to find out we, we might get some data on the, uh, the the effect of pesticides on beetle populations. Um, do we uh, has much um, uh, work actually been done on the effect of, of autumn herbicides, you know, particularly the BYDV sprays that, that we routinely uh, put on on beetle populations? It's, I say, it's so hard. I've been asked this before by farmers about, about specific pesticides. Um, even herbicides do have an effect, as I mentioned in the, in the question and answers. Um, but it's so hard to look up these this kind of information based on studies because it is funded by chemical companies. They are looking at direct mortality, not the environmental effects. I haven't seen any studies on the, the pesticides you mentioned, the BYDV sprays, um, but I expect they would do just because of the mode of action. Um, the thing is that if we could get some data on that within this study, that would be fantastic because we are measuring it in the field. So many kind of studies are lab trials where it's feeding experiments and they do it and they don't look at it over time either. So it would be really nice to get maybe also a historical kind of angle on, on what's been used in that field before. So we can look at the kind of population effects over time, because I, I do understand that you do need to use pesticides sometimes. So really getting down into how these can be used more specifically um, to have less impacts, that would be really nice. Yeah, absolutely. Keith, you were going to come in on that. Can I add, add to that? Just, just to correct one point, actually, the environmental impacts of pesticides are a major part of the uh, data package which has to be delivered before a pesticide can be considered for registration. So some of that data is available for uh, registered products and those are the only ones being used. Secondly, uh, a lot of people doubt. They say, oh, well, a pesticide company may pay for that so, and what have you. Therefore, they expect a certain outcome. Not the case for the, the major uh, uh, producers, manufacturers, because they are actually subject. If you're going to put the pesticides into registration, then the, the, the data has to be produced by good laboratory practice and or good field practice. As a result, it is externally scrutinized as they are doing it. The, the, there are checks and balances to make sure they're actually doing the experiments properly. Problem is, of course, that's commercially uh, uh, a bit confidential, so difficult to get hold of. It's not the quality of the data. So um, I do have some contacts, and Kelly, I'll have a word, if we have a word sometime later on, I'll have a word to see if there's any way we can get uh, some of this data out. It may be useful to you. Well, that would uh, be really good, because I've not found much that's really good data um, yeah. to look at with that. 
Well, I, I, the, the, um, uh, let, let's bring this to the Farming Forum. Uh, you know, if you can highlight some papers that we can perhaps publish on the Farming Forum um, uh, to shed some more light on this, and let's get the discussion going uh, on there as well. Um, uh, uh, one of the questions that's come up um, uh, on, on the on the chat here is about ferric phosphate, which, of course, I mean, now that's the only um, uh, form of slug control that we can use, uh, the only chemical form of slug control that we can use. Um, uh, and um, uh, someone raising the question there, is there any um, evidence that ferric phosphate affects these beetles? Um, Kelly, you've you put the answer up um, on there, but would you just like to um, um, uh, expand on that a little bit? Well, I've kind of, from memory, dim memory, because I looked at this a while ago, but ferric phosphate was one of the ones that had the kind of least impacts as far as I could see. I would be lying if I knew the specifics of this, but I could look into it and look, put it up on the farm, farming forum. But it seemed from my memory, I think it is one of the least kind of direct mortality effects and the least kind of... Um, persistent in the environment. So I would say that's one of the safer ones, which is perhaps why we're still using it. Great. Uh, uh, Becky, you want to make a point here. Uh, do, do you... Well, I'm just going to anecdotally add to that. From the slug trial we did last year, half of the um, plots were obviously treated with ferric phosphate last year. And um, on the observations I made of beetle populations, there was no differentiation where the beetles were. Um, whether they were in the plots that had the slug pellets on or the beetle or or not. So that, you know, obviously I wasn't actually monitoring them, but just um, as an anecdotal um, observation, mm. there were equal numbers of beetles in that scenario. Do, do you apply um, a, a autumn insecticides, BYDV spray, for example, pyrethroids? Um, sometimes it depends on the field and the location. Yeah, is that is it something that the that concerns you, uh, Becky, in terms of uh, the effect of these sprays on beneficials? Definitely, um, and I guess it's not necessarily a concern, but it's obviously we're just trying to work to minimise what we use. Um, mm -hmm. uh, as much as anything, it's public perception of what we're growing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and the less things that we can say that we're applying that people have a um, a phobia over. Um, the better it is. Um, and also being uh, a livestock farmer as well, I think that there's more to be done, the, you know, on, on that side um, and, and using longer rotations. So, um, yeah. Well, I mean, this is certainly something that, you know, uh, as I say, let's let's bring the conversation to the farming forum. Uh, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Andrew, for your comment in the chat. Uh, I think this is something that we can really um, discuss in more detail, perhaps on the farming forum. Uh, and as I say, um, both Keith and Kelly will be will be there to answer your questions, uh, as well as um, uh, um, uh, Clive as, as well. Clive, I was wanted to come back to you because you've already uh set out um uh your own um set of traps um on your on your home farm um uh, uh would, would you just like to sort of um let us know how it how it's gone so far um i know you've already done some uh, you've set out some beetle traps as well as the as the slug monitoring traps i don't know whether the slug monitoring has actually started uh with you yet what are your experiences uh as perhaps one of the first farmers to actually start um uh doing the the the, the monitoring itself yeah, so I got the traps set up at home a week last Saturday. So we did the first count last Saturday, uh, last Sunday. Um, I We only found two slugs under one trap so far, but I could see there was a lot of slug damage um, on some of the newly emerging wheat around other traps. But the, um, it, the soil type's quite variable and it was quite dry still under some of the traps. So I think it was just not wet enough for them um to to be hiding under there yeah it was the wettest trap actually that had the two slugs underneath it how interesting uh, so it's going to be interesting to see how how they they vary um anecdotally i didn't count the beetles last week so i didn't have the kit to do it with but um one of the things that surprised me was how many beetles there were in the pots um and i was horrified thinking how many am i killing that's going to help these slug problems that we've got um what no, i wasn't prepared for by the way uh, just to point out um, uh, that um, uh, the ethics committee at Harper Adams University has looked into 
the Slimers project um, and um, has approved it. Uh, so we're not doing anything uh, that is damaging to the environment or to pests. Um, Keith, you wanted to come in. Yes, yeah, so just to clarify that point, they looked at the original protocol that I wrote for the slugs. Uh, the carabids came after we got approval. <laughs> and right. as we're not running the carabid bit, it's not our... Uh, it's not in our remit to look at that. Very good however, point. Yeah. however, Kelly, you'll know more, but my appreciation would be the numbers that you actually take out with pitfall traps over a short period of time are going to be more than replaced by those coming out of the farm edges. And in any case, and are not going to deplete the current population that much. Would that be right? Yes, we've done. I, I figured out that over the course of my PhD, I killed 40,000 beetles and I love beetles. <laughs> so it is, if I thought that I was having a dent on the populations, I wouldn't be doing it. The data that we're gathering is much more useful than yeah. any effect that we will be having. So yes, it is. And you will see by the numbers that are going into that trap. And that is just a small catchment area. If you're thinking about where they're moving on the whole of the field scale, if they're moving that many in that area, that is one of the main things that I love about people trapping beetles is that they're so startled by how many there are and all of those beetles are eating pests. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> I was surprised. There was, there was obviously some larvae in one of them. I hadn't realised that's oh, what it was. Right, OK. Um, Interesting. And um, there was the, just anecdotally, again, the volume of beetles was higher on the lighter land than it was on the heavier land. Mm, interesting. Uh, Keith, did you have a, another point to make? There? Yes, just a clarification, just to avoid any confusion of something said earlier. You, you quite correctly said if you're going to treat your field through normal farm practice, then go ahead irrespective of the trial. And you also said treat those areas which you would normally treat. Now, there is an exception there in that the whole protocol is reliant on being able to be compared across 29, uh, 29 sites across the country, as you say. That's important for the analysis. And certain basic elements have to be the same at every site. So if you're going to treat, clarify what you said, if you're going to treat according to normal farm practice, then go ahead and treat, but make sure the whole plot is treated. The whole plot needs yes. to be either untreated or it needs to be treated, not any line going up the middle of it, please. Yep, Sorry. No, that's a very good point. Thank you very much for pointing that out, Keith. And it is detailed in, in the protocol, in the, in the, in the handbook uh, that you will receive. Um, listen, we've, we've run out of time, unfortunately. This is a really great discussion. Uh, let's bring that discussion to the Farming Forum. Um, uh, please post your questions on there. Um, uh, uh, if you're taking part in the, in the, 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 the trial, post your observations uh, on there as well. This is a really, really important part of, of this project. It's a farmer-led project, um, and you're your involvement, your views, uh, your observations, your infield observations and your questions and so on, um, and your experiences uh, are valuable. They really are. And it makes a very, very valuable part of this project. Uh, and also for those people who aren't slug sleuths, who won't be capturing uh, the information on the Husk app, um, it will be um, vital that you bring your, your information uh, to the Farming Forum so that we can all share it, so we can get an idea of just what um, beetle populations are doing in the field. So uh, listen, thank you very much everybody for joining us. Um, uh, and um, uh, those of you who aren't joining us, uh, we'll be sending you the um, uh, a link for the, well, everyone will get a link um, for, for this video so you can uh, review it. If you've got any questions, then please do pass them in um, to either myself, tom at boffin.org.uk or sky at boffin.org.uk. Um, uh, and um, we're here to support you in uh, what you find in the fields. Um, so that's all we've got time for at the moment. Um, thank you very much for your questions. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you especially to Dr. Kelly Jowett from Rottenstead Research, to Professor Keith Walters from Harper Adams University, to Clive Blacker from Aggravation, and thank you so much, Becky, uh, Becky Berry uh, from Brimstone Farm in Wiltshire uh, for joining us. Um, uh, anyway, have a great day. Um, uh, do lots and lots of monitoring. Look out for those bugs in the field um, and, um, and look out for more information from us. So thank you and goodbye.